Christ, the Lord is here. Listen to the Christmas bells ring out. Listen to the people sing and shout. Hearken to the news this happy morn. Oh, glory, Christ is born. For oh, the Christmas bells are telling blessed news of Jesus' birth. Hear the mighty praise as well in bringing joy to all the earth. Listen to the Christmas bell ring out. Before we dismiss the kids, let me just uh, take just a second and uh, speak to them. Hey guys, uh, thank you so much for being on your best behavior this morning. You guys were fantastic, and so I'm going to dismiss you to Junior Church here in just a minute, but come see me afterward, okay? If you guys will stand and go down this row and follow, uh, find, go back to Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee, follow Mr. Lee. Everyone else, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Good to see Mario, and uh, very nice to see Ricky, and uh, if uh, you were to shave the beard, you would see Charlie's twin, and right back here, this is Charlie's brother and his dad uh, that, are, that are with us. Made my day walking in this morning, and so glad, glad that you guys are here this morning. Matthew chapter 6. I'm glad everybody else is here as well. Matter of fact, I'll just tell you something. When I see you walk in on Sunday morning, each of you as individuals, and I see your face, it really does make my day. And I just, it just does. Just love seeing you. And uh, it's, it's great being family, isn't it? Amen. And having people that you get to come together and fellowship with. I feel like, uh, I feel like Sunday, every Sunday is a holiday, and it really actually is. You know why, you know why churches meet on Sunday? It's because that's the first day of the week, and that's the day that Jesus was risen. And it's a Christian concept. It's a Christian thing for the church to come together the first day of the week and to celebrate the resurrection. Incidentally, it's not, not really a day of rest. I've had people say, well, you know what, Sunday's my day off. Sunday's my day of rest, and I have to make sure, you know, that, that it's a restful day. Well, actually, it's the first day of the week, Sunday is. The, the day of rest is the last day of the week. If you study the Sabbath, that would be on our Saturday, beginning Friday night until... Uh, Sabbath evening, and uh, Sunday is actually the first day of the week. But people that know Jesus kind of get a, a bonus day, if you will. In other words, it's the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, I'm all in on Sundays, and I hope that you will be. Thanks so much for coming and being here this morning. It is a, it's a wonderful Christmas season that we're celebrating, and uh, go ahead and celebrate Christmas. Don't let the Grinches steal your joy from you, okay? A lot, of, uh, a lot of people right now are really on the attack about Christmas. And I'll be frank with you, I'm not into the commercialization of Christmas, although I do like to walk into stores and, and uh, see the decorations and that sort of thing. I, I enjoy that. But uh, it's not about gifts. It's not about money. It's about the fact that God, God, that God in heaven, came to earth as a man. God did this so that He could die for sin. Because God loves us. No other reason than the fact that God loves us. That's the only reason Jesus came. That's special. It's amazing, isn't it? And so this ought to be a time of the year for you. I recommend, I told our teenagers this last night, you ought to have some time when you, you just you get quiet. You put away distractions like technology and even being around people and you just get alone and you just thank God. And you just reflect on what God's done for you in sending Jesus to die on the cross 
for our sins. God loves you very much. I hope you know God's love. I hope you receive Jesus as your Savior. That's God's plan. Jesus didn't die uh, for no reason. Jesus died so that He could satisfy God's wrath against you and I because of our sin. And He became a sin sacrifice, and, it, and God just made it a free gift that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's literally how universal it is. Sadly, not everyone is going to have and not everyone's received God's gift, which is Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Because they never just simply say, God, I want the gift. I want to be born again. Every person needs to have a day. Needs to have a moment when they stop and they say, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want you to be my Father. I want the free gift of eternal life. And by asking, God will give it to you. That's how good God is. He's good. Well, we're in Matthew chapter 6, and I want to go to verse 19. And uh, we are in a portion of Scripture where Jesus is telling disciples how to think. How to think. And uh, we'll read just a, uh, a couple of verses. I would like to read verse 19, and then I would like to go down and read uh, verse 24. And then we'll pray, and then, then we'll get right into... Uh, right in bringing ourselves up to speed of where we're at in the Scripture, as well as get into uh, really getting some important spiritual truth out of this passage. Verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures in, on, upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Let's read verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now we'll pray, Father. Please help us with our understanding. Help us with our focus. God, I pray that you would help me in no way to stand in the way of truth. God, I pray that you would uh, take my person, my personality, and really diminish it and that you would really increase who Jesus Christ is this morning in each of our minds. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Anybody here gotten to the age when you're more into getting rid of stuff than you are into getting stuff? <laughs> Anybody there? How many of you are like, okay, I'm at a place where I'd rather get rid of something than get something. I really am. I really am, actually, to be quite honest with you. Uh, the only place I want to get stuff is my bank account. Uh, everywhere else, I don't want anything. I'm, I, and I'm actually joking about that. I think I'm joking about it. I have to think about it. Uh, but uh, the reality of it is, is that I've got way too much stuff. Last Sunday, while I was at church, somebody tried to steal one of my boats. And uh, they did steal it. I don't know what happened, but they actually went into my backyard and got my... I have a little dolly that I used to pull trailers around at my house. And uh, they, got, they, they went through my fence. They got my dolly. Left the dolly on my front like on our front porch. It was laying on the front porch. And I use it and they, they moved my uh, one of my boats, they moved it forward about four or five feet into my yard. And I don't know if they were moving it out of the way so they could steal one of the other boats or if that was the boat they were trying to steal. Um, I don't have my Volkswagen Rabbit anymore and so nobody was trying to steal that. So I don't know what they were trying to accomplish but somebody went to some effort at my house to steal something. I have had uh, I've had things still. I've, I've, I used to advertise. I used to say, you know where I'll be on Sunday. So if you're going to, uh, you know, if you're going to rob me, it'd be a good time, you know, to go by my house and break in and take whatever it is that you, you think that you'd like to have that God's given me. Uh, <laughs> whatever those things are. I have to be careful about that because I've had some people say, you know, Pastor, you said, you know, when we rob you on Sunday, I'm thinking, okay. Wait a second. It's actually people I know. I know it's people that I know that steal from me. Um, I had my I had a tool trailer, a five by eight enclosed trailer with all a lot of my tools in it. Uh, I have too much stuff, so a lot I should say, but not all of my tools. I had a lot of my tools in it, and I was in Kentucky doing a wedding for Brother Alex. At 9 a.m. on Saturday morning, somebody came and cut the thing in, on in the street in front of my house, the end of a cul-de-sac. They came and cut uh, the the lock off of the trailer and cut it off of my vehicle, and they stole it and they took it. I had a 6x12 enclosed trailer. I don't have any enclosed trailers anymore. Uh, but I had a 6x12 enclosed trailer, and he was out here 
uh, before we remodeled this building, and one day it was gone. It just it walked away. I had it chained, and they cut the chain, and they took it. So I've had some things taken. So when I read, <laughs> when I read a verse like, Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, I'm very well aware of how we can try to have things that just we can't hold on to. We just can't keep them. Now, I did booby trap my house today, so <laughs> I, the, the, if, if anybody steals anything today, the, the whole place is going to be, the whole block's going to be leveled. You know, it's going to be one of those things where I go, oh, somebody tried to get in my house. So, just in case you're listening and you want to go by my house, today's not your lucky day. Uh, we're all going to lose today, everybody. So, anyway, <laughs> I don't really get upset about it. I'll be honest with you. I, I uh, brother Al Miller called me when I was in Kentucky. He said, he said, uh, where's your, where's your enclosed tool trailer? And I said, uh, it's on my, it's locked on my car in front of my house. No, it's not. And I thought maybe he was messing with me a little bit. And he said, it was there yesterday. It's not there today. Dr. Shermerhorn was actually here. He was staying at my house, probably watched the person uh, steal it in front of him or whatever. So somebody was home. And you'd think I live in a terrible neighborhood. I actually don't. That's, that's where they go to uh, steal things from. But anyway, my point is, is that you just can't hold on to some things. Um, man, moth and rust doth corrupt. Boy, is that true. You know, the only thing that's ever actually made it for a long time that I have is this suit, which was worn by Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. This is the only old thing I have besides my grandpa's shoebox. You say, Pastor, are you sure that's Jimmy Stewart's suit? I, I'm, I'm sure I believe so. Uh, I found it in Marshall's. It was hanging there, and I told Melissa, I said, Look, Jimmy Stewart's suit that he wore in It's a Wonderful Life. And she said, Yeah, it is. So I bought it. And so I've got Jimmy Stewart's suit. I wear it at Christmas time uh, because it's a wonderful life. So, in case you're wondering about that, so I've got an old, I hope don't steal this suit from me, please. Okay, but every time I every time it gets me Christmas time, I wonder I wonder if that thing is still you know serviceable. I wonder if I could still wear it or whether the moths got to it finally. I've never had a moth problem. My granddad did. He had all his uh, all his clothes, all his nice clothes eaten up by moths. So I've never had. Hey, anybody here had a moth problem? I haven't had, but. I know I've seen it happen. Rust. Man, things in South Florida. Don't they rust? I have a 1971 Chevelle. And uh, if you want to steal that, it's in Kansas. Uh, <laughs> I have a 1971 Chevelle. It was my great grandma's car. And I have the original uh, receipt where my grandpa wrote the check for it. And I have the, the options, you know, that it has. The, you know, I have the. The, the window sticker and the, the options that it had. And this, I think she special ordered it, actually. And so uh, we have, I have that. And I don't bring it to southeast Florida because I don't have a garage big enough to keep it indoors. And I know what had happened. It would just rust out. It's a rust-free car. It doesn't have any rust on it. It has the original interior and everything. And if I brought it here, it would just rust out. As it is, uh, it was in one of my dad's sheds, and a mouse got into it, and walked through the headliner, chewed a little hole in my perfect headliner uh, right by the mirror and, uh, you know, walked through the headliner on it and messed some things up in it. And then uh, Brother Chris Callahan, who some of you remember, uh, I gave him a ride in it one time and he spilled some bleach on the black carpet in it. And uh, so things happen. I mean, you get stuff and you like your stuff and it gets destroyed. I have a truck that had perfect paint on it a couple of years ago. But somebody scratched it. And uh, it's not going to be perfect. It's not perfect anymore. And you know, things like that happen, don't they? And just stuff just goes bad. And it frustrates you. So much so that sometimes I think, I just wish I could get rid of everything. Wish I could just all be gone so I don't have to be bothered by how things decay and how things go bad. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he's telling them how to think. He's told them a lot of things that are really practical, hasn't he? He explained to them how that what we think is blessed isn't. Explain what God says is blessed. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. And we look at those initial statements and we disagree with God. And then we look at what God's explanation is and we go, wow. 
Man, God's right about that, what real blessing is. You're a disciple of the Lord Jesus. You don't think the way the world thinks about blessing. Jesus told His disciples as well, He told them how to think about His purpose in coming. He said, think not that I am come to destroy the law. I'm not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. How is He going to fulfill the law? Well, He's going to die for the sins of every person that's ever broken it. That's why Jesus came. He told them how to think about Him, about the Messiah. A lot of people have not received Jesus as their Savior because they have the wrong impression of what we need as far as a Savior goes. Listen, my friend, we don't need to be rescued from the politics of our day. We need to be rescued from our sin. That's our problem. We need to be rescued from whom we are. I don't remember who it is that said this, but a well-known, a well-known writer in the last century, uh, somebody had written a newspaper uh, title, and they basically asked for an answer to... What's the problem? What is this world's problem? And a man, who would have been well-known in his day, a well-known writer, wrote his name, signed his name, and put, you know, if it were me, it would be Ryan Matthew Price is the world's problem. What's the biggest problem in the world? And he wrote, me, I am. And he signed his name to it and mailed it, and he wasn't joking. And you know something? You're the world's biggest problem, too. You are. You don't have any problems without your existence. You realize that? None of your problems exist minus you. Now, I'm not trying to... Uh, you need to come to Sunday school, okay? I'm not trying to tell somebody you don't need to exist. I'm just telling you, you're the problem. And Jesus is the solution to your problem. Well, today we're told about values values. Friend, I just want to tell you something. We value the wrong things. It's just, it's innate. You, you get tired sometimes about hearing about American uh, materialism and capitalism and the greed. You ever get tired just talking about greed and, you know, as though the only greedy people in the world are American capitalists. That, that frustrates me just a little bit because I've been to other places in the world and I've realized everybody's greedy. <laughs> you go to a poor place, man, they want your stuff. I mean, they're reaching and grabbing your stuff and trying to see if you'll stop them from taking it. They're begging you. I went to a country one time, and I think every serious conversation I entered into with the people there, they asked me about sponsoring them to come to the United States. I want to come to the United States. Why? To make a better life. What's a better life? Well, you know, I, I need, you know, money. Uh, you know, stuff. Greed. They didn't have it, but they wanted it. They are greedy about what they didn't have. There are people that have it and they're greedy about that. We're greedy. That's what we are. You say, well, not me, Pastor. You know, I, I, you know I'm more of a, a person who likes to simplify and have less. Yeah, but the stuff you have, you really want. The way that you live, you really value that. And that's just the way we are. And Jesus is reminding His disciples and really kind of letting them know uh, something that is their reality check. And that is that you can value things that are temporal or temporary, but if you value those things, if you lay those things up, you lose them. That's simply what he's saying. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. How many of y'all are watching the Bitcoin thing? Anybody interested in the whole Bitcoin thing? Brother Brian is. He's a, he's a finance guy. Yeah, Mrs. Mrs. Owens, do you own Bitcoin? No, I'm what? watching it. But you're watching it. Do you wish you owned Bitcoin? No, like it's a year too ago? risky. Oh, yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, she don't like the risk. It's temporal anyway. Yeah, it's temporal. That's my point. Okay. Uh, <laughs> last night I asked our teenagers the question. This is funny. When I was speaking to the teens last night, I asked the question, and we were, we were looking at um, in Isaiah chapter 7, where God told Isaiah to tell King Ahaz, Ask me for a sign, uh, whether in the depths, basically the depths of the earth or in the heavens, anything from in heaven and earth, anything from heaven and earth, ask for a sign, and I'll give it to you to show you that the things that, that God had just told him through Isaiah the prophet were true, to prove that those things are true. And Ahaz answered the question by saying, I'm not going to ask anything, I'm not going to tempt, neither will I tempt the Lord God, which is the dumbest thing ever. 
you know, to say to God. They said, ask for anything. And I asked the teenager, I said, what would you like for a sign? They're, they're sad, man. Those kids. <laughs> One said they'd like an oak tree. I'd like there to be a big oak tree here tomorrow, just so that I know. Yeah, it was Shamir. You're the oak tree guy? I can, I can ask God for anything in the world. I'm going to ask him for an oak tree. I'm like, you dumb kids. Uh, another one said, you know, I'd ask for my family to be protected. Um, how would you even know? How's that a sign? How would you know your family's protected? You only know if something bad happens to them. You don't know if, if nothing happens to them. That's not a sign. They, they said the dumbest things. Uh, like, things that are cheap, you know. I said, I want like a hundred trillion dollars. <laughs> then I'll figure out what I want. You know, after that. I mean, if, if God gave me a hundred trillion dollars, that'd be a sign. I'd know God gave me that, right? I mean, at least, at least practically speaking. In all seriousness, if I had whatever, I'd lose it. Or I'd die before I could use it. Because it's temporary. And Jesus told His disciples not to value things that aren't eternal. Friend, I want to tell you, this is, this is so practical, so real. Because here's the deal. You can lay up treasures on earth. In order to do so, my friend, if you lay up treasures on earth, you'll have an investment of your time. You'll have an investment of your heart. You can't lay up treasures on earth and not invest in them. The only thing that you have, which is the life that God's given you. So what you lay up, what you save up, what you accumulate, is what you give the only thing God has given you, which is your life, for. In other words, you're going to trade your life for something. You're going to trade your life for things that moth and rust and thieves can take from you. Or you're going to lay up with your time things that moth and rust and thieves can never take from you. And here Jesus is telling His disciples, you could do this and here's what you'll have, or you can do this and this is what you'll have. And there's a big difference, guys. I fear... I fear that we speak tongue-in-cheek too often about treasures, don't we? Oh, you know, it, it, the, 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 you know, it isn't the things in life that matter. It's, and we say what matters while we spend all our time trying to get the things. Isn't true? I'm going to tell you something. What you do shows what you value. Let me be real with you as a pastor. I know what you value by how involved you are in the ministry. This is your church. This is, this is a place that God is using to reach your Jerusalem. This is the place where God's called you to serve. And how involved you are in your church is, I don't have to be able to see your heart to see where your heart is and what you treasure or what you value. I don't have to see your heart. I can just, I can just look at what you do with your time. I'm going to tell you, we've got some folks in this church that I can tell they value eternal things. They really value eternal things. It's easy to tell. It's easy to see. How do you know? Well, because you see them doing eternal things, investing in eternal things with everything that they have. You say, well, pastor, that's the way we all should be. I know it. You know it. Jesus is telling His disciples it. But the reality of it is, is that we either have treasures on earth or we have treasures in heaven. You say, well, Pastor, I don't have either. Well, you have the things that you value, even if they're not valuable to God. So you don't have to have... I mean, some people just collect things. You ever met somebody, you know, like they're hoarders? Uh, you know, different types of hoarders? Stop looking at each other. They always, they always smirk. People, everybody looking at each other like you're a hoarder. Everybody <laughs> thinks the other person's the hoarder. Okay. <laughs> you ever met a person... <laughs> they just they 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 don't need it, but they like it. For instance, the baseball card people—they're hoarders, aren't they? Card collectors. Yeah. So Joel's a card hoarder. Uh, he hoards cards. <laughs> you got you keep cards, 
Well, I'm not asking for a public confession. I have a booth that you can come to during the week. For the <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. Uh, the reality of it is, is that, man, you, some of y'all, you think, man, it's, it's a piece of paper with a picture on it of somebody. It's a piece of paper with a picture on it. What is that worth? You know, here, let me go to my computer. I'll print you on it. You know? It has no value to them, but it has a lot of value to other people. People pay ridiculous amounts of money. An Arab bought the Mona Lisa. Was it Mona Lisa that sold uh, by, to a Muslim guy uh, like last month? What was, what was the, do you remember the dollar amount? It was crazy. It was like hundreds of millions, wasn't it? I can't remember. It was in the millions, whatever it was, for the Mona Lisa. And an uh, and, uh, Islamic guy bought the Mona Lisa. I thought, what? I, I don't know, I don't understand it, but maybe it's an investment. But uh, <laughs> bought the Mona Lisa a while back. You know, it's a picture to me. I wouldn't pay millions of dollars for that, would you? Well, you couldn't. <laughs> but I would. It's just a picture, right? But some people value things. You say, well, Pastor, that, that's an investment because there are other people that value it. it can make an I understand all that. I'm just telling you that people value different things. And from other people's perspective, the thing has no value. But there are things that God values and God lets you keep for an investment. Folks, listen to me. God has made a formula for your life that involves you having the ability to save. Things that you can keep forever. Eternal matters. And God's challenge to every Christian is see what you can save. No, it's not just see what you can save. It says, don't lay, don't do this, do this. You can't lose eternal things that have eternal value. I'm, I'm serious about this. If you're a person that understands preparation and saving for the future, this ought to really resonate with you, ought to really help you to realize that what I do for the Lord Jesus today, I always have. I'll never lose it. You never lose an eternal investment ever. Pastor, what's an eternal investment? Well, souls are an eternal investment for one thing. I'm curious just because I'd like to know how many people that God has allowed me to lead to Jesus. I've never done it by myself. In other words, I don't think... I mean, maybe a couple of times I interacted with some, someone and there was no connection between anyone else. But most of the people that I've led to the Lord Jesus, I've, I've gotten access to through family or through friends or uh, through neighbors or whatever. But I've been able to lead people to Jesus. And sometimes I've worked hard to do that, a lot of times. A lot of times there's just a lot of investment. I've spent a lot of hours, a lot of time talking to people, answering questions, and uh, just, just preaching the gospel to them. And I've had people that come to know Jesus, I'd be interested to know how many people are in heaven because I preach the gospel to them. Not, not because I, I want to know what the numbers are, but I want to tell you something. Every single person I've led to Jesus Christ is going to be in heaven. Souls are eternal. Souls have eternal value. Every soul of every person will be somewhere forever. I asked the teenagers in the First Priority Bible Club last week, I asked them, do you think that your friend's soul is worth two bucks? Would you give two bucks for your friend to be saved? Now, obviously, you can't pay for someone's salvation. But if giving two dollars will entice somebody to come and hear the gospel, listen, the power of the Holy Spirit just works. If someone sits under the gospel and they hear it, the Holy Spirit speaks to hearts and they know it's true. My experience is when the gospel's preached, people come to know Jesus as their Savior. It's not fake, it's not phony, it's real. The gospel has, it's the power of God unto salvation. And it works. Is it worth two bucks? Would a person's eternal soul be worth $100? I mean, literally a person either spending eternity in judgment or a person spending eternity in fellowship with God, would that be worth 100 bucks? Would it be worth $1,000? In other words, if someone were to go to heaven as a result of the gospel being preached to them, 
And as a result of your investment in their life and their ministry, would it be worth $1,000? Could you put a dollar amount on someone's eternal soul? The Bible says about a soul, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know what a person will give for their soul? Anything. Everything. If you had everything in the world and you could have eternal life because of it and you understood the truth of it, you'd give it. you give everything for it. You know, we as believers, I think too often, we don't value the souls of men enough. We don't value the souls of men enough. You can't buy with a dollar the soul of a person, but you could invest your money into it somehow, couldn't you? You can't buy with your time the soul of a person, but you can invest your time in souls, couldn't you? We're going to have a three-on-three -three basketball tournament here uh, in January, right out in our parking lot here. We did last year for the first time. We had eight kids that got saved, eight teenagers that came to know Jesus as their Savior as a result of it. We're praying this year uh, that we'll have you know closer to 100 teenagers that come and that we'll have 30, 40, 50 kids saved as a result of it. And I believe that's completely feasible. You know, it's going to take a lot of work to do that. We're going to have to have set up. We're going to have to have planning. We're going to have to have scheduling. We're going to have to give our entire day on that Saturday to run that. And everybody here is going to be needed for that. I need all your help to be able to run that. And every one of us is going to need to do something uh, in order to help make that thing work and happen so that we can preach the gospel to those teenagers. How much is that worth? She can't put a price on it. It'll cost us money, it'll cost us time, it'll cost us effort. We're going to have to invest in it in prayer. We're just going to have to invest ourselves in it. But it's worth it, isn't it? Why? Because those teenagers are eternal souls. Okay, so then let, let's see how that translates. The parking lot's going to need to be prepped in order for those souls to get saved. Is there eternal value in prepping the parking lot? Sure is, isn't it? You know, we, a lot of times we think it's just a parking lot. There's nothing spiritual about a parking lot. No, there's nothing spiritual about the parking lot, but we've got to have it so the kids can play ball on it. It's got to be in shape. And anything we do to make it work well is an eternal investment. It's not because, oh, this is God's building, you know, and we're like investing into something that God owns. Well, God owns this building, but this building's a tool. Anything you invest in has eternal value. Keeping the score, refereeing, uh, just going out and shooting hoops with the kids, serving lunch, cooking a hot dog. Is there anything eternal about a hot dog? I hope not. <laughs> I mean, 100% all beef quarter pound hot dogs, not you know trashy hot dogs. Anything eternal about a hot dog? No. But you see, that hot dog is cooked and prepared for what purpose? To what end? So that eternal souls of men can be affected by it. You see what the Scripture is saying here? Words, how you invest your life. Um, let me ask you a question. Is there anything in this service this morning that has intrinsic eternal value? Who? Oh, the baptism? What do you point at? Uh, yeah, this is a spiritual step uh, uh, that Timothy's taken this morning in getting baptized. Okay, is that of eternal value? I'm talking about in this, in this room, in this place. I'm going to tell you, if God affects your thinking this morning spiritually, this preaching service this morning has intrinsic eternal value. What about worship? Is worship meaningful to God? Does worship matter to God? We were made to worship God, to give Him glory. When you worship this morning, my friend, you're doing something that's eternal. And it has value. It's amazing when we step back and we ask ourselves the practical question, what are treasures in heaven versus treasures on earth? You know, it could be something that looks like an earthly treasure, couldn't it? Yesterday we sat on our church bus and we looked at how to take care of it. Because we realized that church buses cost a lot of money if they're decent ones. We're glad we have the one that we have. 
And we were just talking about taking care of it. We were talking about what it costs for a church bus. We were talking about the profit in it. Do you know how many people get saved because of our little mini bus every year? It's amazing. When I sit back and I think about how many people get saved because of that tool that we have. Is, it, is that a treasure? Yes. It actually is. It's not a treasure because the bus is going to heaven. I hope it stays here. <laughs> okay. It's a treasure because of what it represents, what it is. We have things that are treasures, don't we? And we as believers just need to learn to dial things back and think like a disciple or think like a person who values eternal things. Let, let's uh, finish up this passage. I know, it's, I know it's a simple concept this morning, but I want us to see that what we need to have is a clear eye. Okay, verse 21, the Bible says, Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. John Rice used to say something. He, he wrote it down. He said it in preaching a lot. I never heard uh, John Rice in, in person, I think, but one time. He died when I was four years old. But I've read John Rice. He's influenced me a lot because of the things uh, that he's written. Very prolific author in the last century. And he used to say something. He said, you know, sometimes people say to me, Brother Rice, I feel like... He said, I feel like you think that God is interested in a man's wallet. And he'd preach about giving or whatever. He said, I feel like uh, you think that God is interested in a man's wallet. And John Rice, his response was, well, he is. God wants a man's wallet. And God wants the pants they're in. And God wants the man in the pants. That's all God wants. You think God really cares about a wallet? You think He really cares about pants? What's He care about? He cares about the man in the pants. See, He cares about the person sitting in your seat. That's what God wants. God wants the person who's sitting in your seat this morning. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It doesn't take very long of talking to somebody to find out what is meaningful them, does it? I, I make it a practice of being able to converse with people about things that are meaningful to them. And not always spiritual things, just things that matter to people. If you're into something, I'm into it because I'm into you. Because you're important, you matter to God, you matter to me. And so, it doesn't take me very long to figure out what people care about. What matters to them. Some people are big time into politics. Some are into hobbies, some are into sports, some they're just into different things. It doesn't take me very long to figure that out. But God said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And what you invest your time is, is what your treasure is. What you invest your time in is what your treasure is. And where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. That's your heartbeat. You want to know somebody's heartbeat, just look at what they invest in. You'll find out what they treasure, and you'll know where their heart's at. Okay? Now, one last point Jesus uses to illustrate it is, is light. He said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole, whole body shall be full of light. Now, the idea of single is focus. If you have the focus on the right thing, the, the, everything else is good, right? Everything else is full of light. Then he goes on to say, But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Really profound statement Jesus made. Again, who's the audience? Who is our audience? Who? Disciples. Disciples. These are followers of Jesus. Not all believers, we know Judas wasn't, but all disciples. I can't help but think when Jesus is speaking, there were more disciples than just the twelve. But I can't help but just think about, in my mind, envisioning the audience where Jesus is speaking these words. And I can't help but thinking that maybe His eye rested on a person when He said this. I always use Charlie, because Charlie's a good sport. He said, if thine eye be full of darkness, how great is that darkness? What did Judas value? Remember, he was a thief and he kept the bag. Remember when they broke the, the alabaster box of ointment and anointed Jesus with it uh, for his death? And he said, why was this not sold? and the money given to feed the poor. And the Bible says this, He said not because He cared for the poor, 
but because he was a thief and kept the bag. <clears throat> In other words, his eye was evil. He talked poor, but actually he liked money. Cared about money. There are people that are part of charitable organizations, not necessarily so that they can enrich themselves, but just so that they can handle the money. They just love the money. They just like, they just like to get whatever they have. It may not technically belong to them, but they're handling it and that's good enough. I have no idea what Judas did to enrich himself personally. I know that the 30 pieces of silver he threw down on the ground after he was paid that money. But, but I'll tell you what affected what, what Judas's God was. It was money. That's what made what mattered to him the most. And Jesus' commentary on it was the exclamation of how great. The idea is grand, how large, how massive, how amazing is that darkness. <clears throat> there are people who can't get past the mention of money. You just can't get past it without it being just this sidetrack. I mean, just this talking about money. <laughs> you ever go to church and you say, well, you know, all the pastor talks about some money. Talk, that's all we talked about today, really, isn't it? Money. I can't say it like, what's your boy, Tony, that says money? Mike Murdoch. Mike Murdoch. He's a thief. Uh, <laughs> money. I can't say it like him, but, you know, that's what we've talked about today, isn't it? And people hear that sometimes, and if your eye is full of darkness, all you hear is money. You don't hear anything I said today. You don't hear anything Jesus said in the Scripture. All you hear is money. And you think, He wants my money. They're trying to, God's trying to get my money. And you don't want any part of it. You actually reject the whole concept of valuing eternal things because of the great darkness that's in you. You know, it's probably not true of anybody here today. Probably nobody here today values the wrong things that way. But to some degree, it's true of all of us at some times. Wouldn't you agree? All of us have invested in our lives in things that are temporal. And if we look back to it, we say there's nothing in heaven from that. And if we're going to be disciples of the Lord Jesus, we've got to learn how to think. And I'd just like to ask you a question today. What kind of an investor are you in eternal matters? What level are you? What level of investor are you? Are you low level? Are you a mid level? Are you a high level? Or are you just all in? Just all in. When I was a teenager, this passage of scripture was preached very well to me and affected my life. I tell you, it just affected me. Somewhere that happened to my wife too. Matter of fact, it was something we were just in agreement about when we got married was that we just wanted our lives to be lived for Jesus Christ. I determined I, several times, but I think I finalized when I was nearly 20, that I didn't care what my life amounted to so long as it had eternal value. And I just wanted to belong to God. I just wanted the things that I had to be God's. And I always said, God, I'll give you anything because I, I don't have anything. Everything I have belongs to you because I'm yours. And I just surrendered myself and everything with it. Everything God wanted to give me, I just gave to God. And my friend, he still got it. You could go by my house today, you could break in. Don't do it today, you'll get blown up. But you could break in and you could take my dearest treasure. And if you were to say that to me, Pastor, I stole your favorite thing. I don't know what it would be. Honestly. If you were to take my, my, my dearest treasure, you say, Pastor, your wedding pictures. I'm not sure where they're at. <laughs> your whatever. I've got a lot of stuff. If people know me. I've got a lot of stuff I need to get rid of. Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. They took your favorite thing. I'd be like, what? What would they take? What was it? Because I don't know what my favorite thing is. That's the honest truth. 
don't know what my favorite thing is because I don't have anything that I really love. I don't have a treasure. I don't have an object that I really love. That's a fact. Because I only want to love things that are eternal. Is that true for you? I'm not the example. Jesus is the example. But I'm just asking, is that true for you? Could somebody go by your house today and devastate you? Could somebody hack you and devastate you? Could somebody get something from you that would wreck your life? Not if what you have is eternal. And that's a fact of discipleship. Father, I just pray that you would help us to comprehend and Lord, to evaluate our lives on the basis of this example. And Lord, help us to see any darkness as great darkness and help our eyes to be single in these matters. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have a baptism. And so I need to change real quickly. Brother Todd is going to come leading a song. And uh, it will only take a minute. But uh, we'll get the kids in here on the front row. Brother Taj will lead this song, and we'll have a baptism in just a minute. By the way, we're having a baptism next week. I've got several folks that are going to get baptized next week. If you need to, uh, let me know, and I'll include you. So, be just a minute. Maybe let everybody stand up for a minute, Taj. First indoor baptism in our church ever. We've had one parking lot baptism. Every other baptism has been at the beach, but we have changed some things for sake of time because of having services in Miami Beach. So, I want to get Timothy. Are you ready to get baptized? You dressed in what you're wearing. Is that what you're wearing. Okay. You need a change. Okay. Yeah, he's changing right now. Take the car out of your pocket. Tie off. <laughs> Last week after the service, Timothy said, Pastor, you didn't baptize me today. I said, would you come ready? And he looks at me like, uh, <laughs> ready as I'll ever be. I'm ready to go. Come on up here, buddy. Come on up. Oh, you got to get your socks? Yeah, okay. All right. All right. Come on up. And uh, why don't you stand right here and we'll have a quick conversation. Okay, right here. Turn around and face everybody, if you will, please. Now, this is uh, Timothy Robertson Riffle. And uh, Timothy, you, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Yeah, when was that? You don't have to know the date, but tell us when that happened. Where were you at? On Wednesday. On Wednesday? Was it church? No. Was it home? No. Okay, trusted Jesus as a Savior. And you know that being baptized today, this, isn't, this doesn't save you, right? You understand that baptism is a picture of what Jesus did when He died for your sin, was buried, and rose again. And you want to follow and believe His baptism today? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's very simple. There's nothing complicated about baptism. Matter of fact, it's so simple that in the New Testament church, one of the first things that we saw every time somebody got saved is they got baptized. In Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip had been used by God to give the gospel to a man from Ethiopia that traveled all the way to Jerusalem for the feast and the Passover. Or for, I'm sorry, for a feast. And he had left Jerusalem. He was reading Isaiah 53, actually. And the Holy Spirit led Philip to go and join to the chariot. And he asked the man, you understand what you read? And the man said, how can I except some man should guide me? And they read it. And the Ethiopian asked the question about the things that were prophesied about Jesus. Did, did the prophet say this about himself or about some other man? And Philip opened his mouth, the Bible says, and explained to him the Scriptures, expounding him the Scriptures. They were going along in the outside of Gaza and there was a place where there was water and the Ethiopian said to Philip, he said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? See, baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, but it's an identification. It's really an open declaration that I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live for Jesus with my life and I just want everybody to know it. So it's an open declaration. It's an important decision in a person's life. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 
and that qualified him for baptism. Now, baptism is not something that is done to you without your decision or your choice. Baptism is something you make a decision to do following your faith or your belief in Jesus. And that's what we're doing here today, just so everybody understands it. This is a great example. If you're here today and you say, well, I've never done that, well, this maybe will uh, bring up some questions for you. It's an important testimony as well to people that you know, to let them know that you have received Jesus as your Savior. So we're going to get in the water, hopefully, without too much of... Uh, <laughs> without it being too cold. I'm a little afraid of this right now. But we'll get in and, and uh, we'll it'll just take a second. You ready, Timothy? I know everybody else wants to be in here right now. <laughs> We're going to have a, 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 a diving contest this evening. <laughs> so, Belly flop. All right. I want, why don't you take my hand? I'll let you down here. Okay, give you a. Now that's cold, isn't it? Okay. Come on down, buddy. I got hold You want to stand there for a second and get used to it? Okay. Now here's what we're going to do when he actually gets baptized. He's going to go all the way under the water. So I want you to take your uh, fingers and hold your nose. Hold your nose closed. Keep your mouth closed. And what I'm going to do is, here, I'm going to put my hand here and you grab a hold of my wrist, okay? Hold on to my wrist. And when, uh, when I baptize, you go down. I'll pull you right back up, okay? Timothy Robertson, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. All right, good job. <laughs> Timothy doesn't swim. <laughs> So that takes a lot of bravery right there to go underwater like that. So. All right. All right. Congratulations. All right. All right. You're dismissed.